is at Stella Bell, right? So she's a you know a professional writer, as we said before. She's a former elite model. She that's did, from a long time ago. Once, that almost doesn't count, but okay. She once drove drunk to Canada and threw away her model. <laughs> life. She wrote a book called Uncrap Your Life. <laughs> <laughs> She had yeah. once had a really horrible, horrible job as a car salesman, which I can identify with. And no, did you do that mom. too? Did no, you do that I too? Sold, I sold electronics. And then uh, at one time I tried selling uh, wine over the phone. <laughs> cold, I cold called people out of the white. Oh, and I, I hated it. But I was so desperate for a summer job. Like I was... <laughs> That I refused. I refused to quit. I lasted three days, and finally, they were like, "You know, we both know you 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 don't like this. You're fired." <laughs> I was like, "Thank you, thank you for firing me because I couldn't quit on my own." You know. <laughs> All right. So, in a nutshell, okay, who am I? Whatever. Yeah. Um. Oh God, it's terrible to talk about yourself. But anyway, no, it's good. It's good. Let, let's let's go. Let's go a little bit backtrack. Why I wrote that book. So in 2011, I was dirt poor. I mean, when I, I mean, I was on food stamps. I was a single mother from a terrible relationship, uh, tired, very, I mean, just depressed is putting it mildly, <laughs> ready to drive myself into a wall. I lived, my daughter and I lived on $10,000 in one year, mm -hmm. over a whole year. <laughs> so uh, poverty doesn't yeah. even, it's. I'm not from a I'm not from a poor family though. I grew up middle upper middle class. So I'm you know going out to dinner. I'm spoiled, in other words. Um, so poverty was like a big wake up call. However, I am very grateful that I had to go through that because being poor opened my eyes to the reality of most people's existence. And I also don't take things for granted in the same way. Honestly, if I'd never been broke, I would never appreciate money. I wouldn't even care about how to cultivate it and or where it comes from. Like, it totally changed me. And for that reason, I, I don't, I look at everything in life as a, a lesson now because, you know, I could have just remained in that horrible state, but that horrible state opened my eyes and, and I found like, writers i found james altucher he mm. knows that i love him you know but um <laughs> mm -hmm. i found this writer and his stories were so nuts it's like the first story i ever found of his how to deal with crappy people and i was at the point where i was i was so poor that i was like i'll fucking do anything to get out of this poverty that enter the car dealership <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, I couldn't believe they hired me, number one. Like, I have a degree in East Asian studies. Like, and I'm an artist and, a, like, you know, I'm this crazy person, right? So the fact that they hired me was like, oh my God, I'm in. I got, I got paid, like, tons of money, and I was like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> like, it's a racket. It's a car mafia world. Holy crap. Yeah. I saw so much greed i've never seen so much greed in my life it exposed me to the whole financial world money how money gets transferred from those who have it to those who are in with the in crowd um i've never been so pressurized and treated like a piece of crap in my life now i was a decent salesperson for this one fact People trusted me. I cannot lie to people. <laughs> I can't lie to people. I cannot look at them in the face and say, this car is $15,000. And when it's 12, like I'm a bad liar. So basically people would come to me. And the second I got with them, they're like, oh my God, you're actually a real person. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had repeat customers. Like I had tons of repeat customers because like what car I couldn't operate in the dealership world though. I was coming under increasing pressure to lie, to be deceitful and to treat people like shit, which is not really in my wheelhouse. 
Mm. I had a number of conflicts with a direct manager over me. I basically told him one day, I gave him an ultimatum. I mean, I'm giving, I'm a lowly car saleswoman. I'm giving my manager an ultimatum. I said, look, I'm tired of you yelling at me. And the day you treat me like a human being is the day I'm on your team. Until then, I'm out, and I slam my fist down. <laughs> I did like this violent thing when no one else was around. I was very strategic in that. Yeah. And I just thought, I'm not taking this bullshit from a person with half the integrity that I have. Mm -hmm. It's just, and that's when I, I realized my days were numbered. And it's because basically my customers could see through my managers, and they called them out. And I looked like I made them look, I mean, uh, not, not on purpose, but what happened was their integrity was being revealed to them through my customers who were used to the way that I ran things and business, making mm -hmm. deals straight up without any bullshit. I should have been running that place because basically it became clear that they're full of shit and I'm not. <laughs> uh -huh. And so I had to get out, get out, skedaddle. I went on to my next gig, which was a driver where I deprogrammed my mind. Sounds extreme, but I did it. No. I got rid of fear a lot. Not all fear, but I got rid of a lot of the stuff that was anxiety, fear, and I replaced it with knowledge. I spent about a year listening to audiobooks. Who'd you listen my best to? recommendations, Nikola Tesla, My Inventions is the number one to the people to listen to. And then Peter Thiel, Zero to One. That's the second one. I'm not, mm. not familiar with that one. And why Those do you like two. Thiel's book so much? What? Why oh, like it's genius books? because that book, it, it basically says, okay, look, there's tons of competition. You don't want to move into a space where there's tons of competition. You want to be like Elon Musk or someone that is going into a field where there's no competition whatsoever. Mm. You go with your strip and, and the, but there's demand. So it's like you go into these unknown territories where no one knows what is going on there. You develop the best thing ever and you, you're, you'll be changing the course. It sounds like the blue ocean uh, strategy book that came out about 10 years ago. That's also like uh, INTJ kind of thinking, or at least, N, you know, NT kind of thinking, you know, always yeah. be forward looking. It's just most people have the herd mentality, so it's easier to go into a field with competition that's already been carved out. Mm. But really the true genius lies in carving out this new world. Steemit is, I believe, part of that because there's never been anything like it before. Mm. And mo most people are not cut out for that. You know, mm -hmm. A lot of people are S-types, SPs, SJs, and they – they're looking to the present and the past, you know, they're not really, it's not in their wheelhouse, as you said, you know, to look forward. Well, they don't so. know how to take advantage of an opportunity like this. They see an opportunity and they think scam. They think, no, I got to stay on the path I'm on because it's the path my parents recommended my university. It's done me well for the last five years. You know, they're, they're not, I used to think anybody could be like me. I, not, not to, talk myself up too much <laughs> but, no, no, no. but I, uh, I'm just what? gonna be honest that I have well, you're like a go-getter like I think of you you're a go-getter I am right I am. I've walked through life succeeding at everything and at the same time feeling like I am literally a piece of shit I'm nothing special <laughs> <laughs> I've looked at other people and, I, and other people have always come to me <coughs> as the guy who has all the answers. And I'll, I've always been like, I have, I don't know, just do this. And they're like, wow, that's great advice. Thanks. You know, and I'd be like, you know, why can't, I, I'm not doing anything special here. You know, anybody can do what I do, but I don't think I, I've come to the conclusion after 45 years that they, can. and it's kind of sad. I actually, what? Wait, what's your big conclusion? I'm sorry, what was that it? After, after 45 years, that not everybody can do the things that I do. And I think uh, part of the explanation is in personality psych psychology. Yeah. Um, um, there's a, I think there's a huge um, correlation between also not thinking you're special 
which believe it or not, there's a consistency between personality types where they have a tendency to just not see themselves as special as everybody else sees them, but they're the same personalities that have a tendency to do things really well. Um, and I think that maybe there's a link between the psychology of thinking you're special, not special, as one of my favorite things is, and actually identifying with that. And somehow, some way, some talent comes out of thinking you're not special. If you think that whatever you're doing is just a whatever, uh, then you'll succeed it like it's a whatever. If you uh, hold in your mind's eye that something is unachievable, well, you're going to create situations and you know, you're going to create a mentality where you'll agree that it's unachievable. So if you don't think you're special and you think you can do it and anybody can do it, then sure as shit, anybody can. And I think that's a, a marker of personalities. But I'm not. But I also think there's a certain level of um, maturity that comes along with that. It's not explicitly. Specific. I'd like to add. I'd like to add one thing that came up when when you were talking. Yeah. That is, I believe that culture plays way more of a role than people are conscious of. Absolutely. And we did not go to schools except. I went to a private school when I was very young which had an indel left an indelible mark on my um, uh, cultivation of creativity because it was a small school run by ex hippies. Mm -hmm. We could do, we could bring food and cook it. We had a, we had a pet dove in the kitchen. Like we made mashed potatoes. We made butter. We did everything hands on. Uh, we made candles. We were around hot wax. Oh my God. <laughs> no, we, we were into everything. They developed a, a true sense of, of respecting your innate creativity. And I think that it's been snuffed out through jobs. Jobs are a, like a, a, like a creativity killer right there. You tend to second guess your best ideas because you're going to be presenting them in front of your manager who thinks you're a piece of crap or whatever because that's what they do and i i think that people have lost the ability to think of themselves as creative people everyone has creativity i do not think it's something special i think everyone has it within them i mean we all dream right that's the most creative thing you can do no one is dictating what your dream is going to be. It's just the people that, okay, it comes down to this. How many people listen to those whispers? Because your creative mind is only a tiny whisper, and it's like tapping you on the shoulder. And how many people actually stop and, and just like say, hey, I'm going to do it. There's the gap. There's the gap. Creativity exists and within everyone, but, okay, who thinks of themselves is able to pull it off and is not afraid to go there and develop the idea. It took me like 40 years to get to this point. I now have an automatic creative mind, which means the books, they come to me. It's already pre-visualized the entire thing. Okay. And it's bizarre because these things just come to me in a pre Package. created way i don't have to think through them they evolve like a movie it's like watching my own film in my mind cool. that's why i studied tesla a lot because he built his machines all in his mind before he would ever consider creating them in a physical form we have lost the ability to pre-visualize things in such a way work everything out all the details in your mind first then do it. And if it's still interesting to you, like a couple of days later, then that's what you need to be doing. But, you know, that's, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if people can relate to that or not. Well, um, that's, that's a very INTP thing. That's a very, you know, the you're. Pre-visualization? Is that what you're talking about? And, yeah, and uh, it's an NT kind of a thing. Yeah. It's looking. You're dominant. Oh, speaking of which. I want to sh give you a preview while we're on this of the book that I, I finished the story a couple days ago and I'm painting 16. It's called, it's called the little minnow and data. That's the title of it. And it has meaning. Okay. Can you see that? That's the first one. It's a children's book, but it's a book for oh. steam it. It is stories. Okay. That's the first one. Okay. The little minnow. Okay. 
the the minnow in the previous one, she was like in a school of fish. She got lost. She's lost. Very and psychedelic. She, she's afraid, you know. It's a psychedelic okay. Yoda. <laughs> it all relates to steam, though, because there. See the golden. Do you see? This is the entrance to the steam at cave. She's away from the school of fish. Now she's looking at weird creatures she's never seen before. That reminds me of that 90s book with the single shiny scale on the fish. Oh, yes, yes, probably. Never and then the steam, it, the steam it cave, it's right in there. And then the story, it's going to get crazy because in this whole world, like Dan is building this structure that the minnow, little minnow fish comes in there. She's like, what is this crazy structure that's being built? I don't understand it. She goes, okay, I'm going to take a picture of it because I'll know I'll be able to figure out later if I just have enough information. So she takes little, so it's, it's about exploring the steam at world and seeing all these weird things and things that no one knows and understands. Well, why it's is gonna be in a cave? Shouldn't it be like a floating metropolis in, in the clouds? No, because oh, it's in beta. So it's in beta stage right now. Oh, it, will, it, will, it, will, it will be <laughs> loose. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. After the beta stage, we will all be chipping away the cave entrance so that all the creatures can go out and <laughs> It will extend out up, you know. But anyway, so that's a preview, a preview. Exclusive <laughs> world preview right here on the Steam Smart Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> the Steam and Exclusive by Stella Bell showing the new children's book slash. It's not really a children. It's, it's like the story of what happened. Uh -huh. <laughs> like a I memoir. Also, I also want to let everybody know that that was not planned even a little bit. <laughs> Stella just ran with that one. <laughs> <laughs> the like, yes, planning. Stirring, stirring the pot. Stirring the pot. Stirring the pot. The only planning that happens on this show is that happens in my head, and then I try <laughs> to steer it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now we're we're in my world now like <laughs> the crazy well that's not that crazy it, it just it came to me though like i thought well okay it's time for that sure. i didn't know what i was gonna make it just the story well, the fun part that's the fun part it's an it's an yeah. exploration yeah. everyone has it but it's like time do they have the time hmm. all right okay well, so uh, I think we're done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's, uh, let's wrap it up. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Uh, thank Lee. you for the opportunity. Oh, I hope thanks that. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, no, thank you.